Hi. 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 Right. We're live. We're live. Hi. Welcome, everyone. Yeah, this is working. Yay. Um, hello. Thank you all for joining us um, for the Bookbound 2020 uh, From Home Literary Festival. My name is Malu Ansaldo, and I'm here to host this conversation with writers um, Dan Richards and Philip Hoare. This event has been curated with uh, Was a Fury magazine to raise, raise money for uh, a UK-based mental health charity called uh, Mind. So in case you haven't donated to them, uh, you can still do it after the talk. Mind provides advice and support to empower people experiencing mental health problems. And their statistics show that on an average, there's one um, in every four people in the UK are experiencing a mental health problem every year. And um, 2020 is certainly not a typical year for everyone. So we all wanted to support this charity very much. Uh, so I hope you uh, watching at home can help Mind as well. And you can make your donation on the Just Giving page from the festival or on the Mind uh, website directly. Uh, and if you want to find out more, you can go onto the festival uh, website as well. Now I'm going to do a quick intro to the two amazing writers that I have here with me. And then we're going to start talking about the writing and their books. Philip is an author. His uh, books um, include Leviathan or The Whale, The Sea Inside and Rising Tide, Falling Star. And he started um, a live big read uh, of Moby Dick in 2012. And you're now doing another big read of a different book, The Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner. And we're gonna be talking about that in a little bit, yeah? Yeah. Great. And Dan Richards here, uh, he writes about travel, culture and art. His first book was called Holloway written with uh, Robert McFarlane and Stanley Dunwich. And then he wrote the Beachwood Airship Interviews and Climbing Days as well. And he survived writing those books, which is great. And his latest one is called um, Outpost. And we're gonna be talking about that book. And I'm gonna show you both of their latest books because I've got them and I think they're very beautiful. And Dan asked me oh, to. Very nice. Yes, very, very good. Nice. Yes, <laughs> okay. we're talking about these two books. Um, I don't know if you guys can see the covers, but they're very, um, the kind of color, com you know, there's kind of a combination of colors there. But um, yeah, both of your books are talking about the outdoors and talking about being outdoors, which is something that we can't really do right now that much, which has made the reading very interesting, at least for me, and refreshing. But also they talk about faraway places, sometimes um, kind of isolated in places like in Iceland or um, in the middle of the sea when you feel on your own. And I wonder whether there is something about that, um, that the current situation is making you think about writing those books and those places in a different way. Um, Philip, is it? <sighs> yeah, what I mean, for me, when it's, the, it's, you know, for, for me, it's the sea. Yeah. Um, and I'm, I don't know whether I should be doing it, but I still am. Uh -huh. um, I was swimming also, you know, like we, me and Philip share a, a yeah. passion for swimming and he's lucky because he's close to the sea, so he can yeah, yeah. and I'm like a fish <laughs> out of the water, so. So I sneak like a thief in the night on my bicycle, <laughs> pedaling down. I cycled the wrong side of the road. No. And I go down and you don't see anyone now. And this is like two or three o'clock in the morning. And um, it's uh, the only other entities I see are foxes and rabbits and hear owls and things. Yeah. And, um, and the sea has been, the past couple of weeks has been really magical because it's, um, it's, it's, it, 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 it's very calm. There's not very much shipping at all. So all the, the Southampton where I live, the, the, the port now, all the liners are, are berthed. So there's none of that. Um, one or two containers sometimes, no, no leisure craft, almost all the ferries have stopped. So the sea is a very different place and it feels very different and it feels very calm and meditative. It's very cold still, but remarkably in the past, couple of weeks it's been full of bioluminescence oh wow so as you move through the water 
these nebulae erupt from your fingertips. Um, it's funny because I, I was swimming there when the Lyriads, the, the, the shooting stars were falling and actually it was much more action in the water, you know, these incredible, and it, what it is, the, the dinoflagellates, the, the, the organisms, and they're reacting, actually they're kind of reacting in a stressed way because they're trying to freak you out, trying to scare you off. Um, um, but uh, the consequence is you leave a kind of aura around you. And I always think about the because I swim in exactly the same place every day when I'm in England, when I'm in Southampton, I swim in exactly the same place from exactly the same, same, same point. Uh, it's a kind of ritual for me. It's not exercise or anything. Um, so I wonder if I, I leave a memory of myself in the water. Mm. And actually with the bioluminescence, you sort of do, you need a yeah. sort of like, um, so it's so that sense of, but the, 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 what, it's always, the grass is always green, isn't it? Because I, I, I'm so lucky that I can go swim, but I, I'm just thinking, I want to be in Cape Cod. I want to be on Dartmoor, swimming in the dart, you know, all these places. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure I know for, for Dan, that must be equally kind of frustrating. It's a, it's a strange one for me because it is that thing of, often you can only see in retrospect what you had at the time. Mm -hmm. And yeah. I guess it's, it's, it's it's lovely to to think of you having this kind of this bloom around you because it would in just hearing you say it 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 makes me think that you must be very present in that moment because you're just aware that there you are and you're floating in this kind of not a void as such but you're fr you're floating you are you and it is other you know and i've always thought that about the sea this kind of amazing kind of living otherness and when I was doing the Outpost book, I went off looking for all sorts of different othernesses. But um, when I looked at the sea, I was looking more at lighthouses and things like that. But when I was in Iceland, I found Iceland as a landscape so interesting and haunting and other that towards the end of a chapter, when I'm actually flying out, I saw my own shadow, the plain shadow fall away beneath me. Nice. And I began, you know, instantly I thought, well, that's also part of me, you know, this is part of this is the part of me and my experience that Iceland keeps. Mm. And whenever I'm on a plane, you know, well, I try not to do that too much. It doesn't trains don't quite have the same shadow, but you do get that sense of a part of yourself that the land or the sea beneath you keeps. You can't take it all with you. And there it goes. And it sped along this this um, lovely sort of because the shadow undulates with the landscape and it sped along over the lava of Keflavik and then it kind of went into the sea and it went sort of like mm. and you just got the sense that it's sort of like I was okay my my soul the soul of my time in Iceland was fine but then when it got to the sea it was like and now we have you yeah. and that sense of um, a space almost you know your time on a space being not your own you know in a land you're there as a visitor. And certainly with the lockdown and everything, and I'm in central Edinburgh, but to towards nighttime when the streets really quietened down, I have begun, begun to think of myself as a visitor, mm. which in a city, um, you know, is quite a haunting thing when you're out of place, even in a sort of supposedly human environment. Mm. Um, and it is quite uncanny in a way that I think it's more easily perhaps we more easily think of ourselves as visitors to vast yeah. big scapes or seas or things like that but I think one of the things that's happened is that the uncanny close at hand have kind of you know made itself known does that make sense yeah and also I'm, I'm just thinking um because we were having a little chat before and um you know you're saying uh Philip that yeah, it's really hard to leave a trace in the ocean because it's moving, the water is changing, but all of a sudden you had this moment of magic where you could see your shape in it, which is very hard. Mm -hmm. And then usually the isolated places where you go to, there's the thing of like, leave no trace. You know, you go there, you take all your stuff with you, but we do leave a trace somehow and the place leaves a trace in us. Mm -hmm. always I always think because I do a lot of traveling as well for work and I do a lot of touring and I always think is there a way that all these kilometers and my like do I have a mileage thing like a car <laughs> like yeah. is it is it is it count is it staying in me as well and um 
and I don't know, I guess, I guess that is interesting too, because we were talking earlier about us as a, our own nature as well, right? Like you both sort of got into this thing that you do um, as adults is not a thing that you would say, oh yeah, you know, it was in my nature when I was growing up, I was like in the water every day or I was climbing mountains every day. Um, and then you changed it and now it's part of who you are. Uh, so that has left a mark, but what is the thing that sort of got you there? Do you think it was meant to be or, you know, was it through your creative practice that you got there or was it because that thing was there and now you've made it your practice? For me, it was because I'd lived in London for 20 years and I worked in, in, in music. I was working for Rough Trade and I ran my own record label. And uh, practically from 1976 to 1990 something, I lived a subterranean life. I lived under the streets of London, not on the streets, but under the streets because I was always, you know, gigs and nightclubs and living this very sort of troglodytic life in which the natural world had very little bearing at all. Mm. Um, I, it used to be shocking for me when I came back to Southampton for a weekend and I would look out of the train window and suddenly my eyes would kind of elasticate and suddenly yeah. look at, at somewhere which wasn't just, you know, 10 right. meters away, yeah. look to the, land, to the, to the horizon. Um, and then, then uh, uh, various things happened and I was on the dole and I was living in Hackney and, um, and I, start, I started to think about kind of swimming because I was felt, I was born and brought up in this place. I still live in the, this is the house I was, grew up in, um, uh. living in still now. And, um, and I was so fearful of the sea as a boy. And, you know, it's, the sea's only a mile over there. And you can hear the foghorns, you can hear the seagulls and, and the docks uh, and all of that. So there's a, there's a very tactile, tangible relationship to the sea here. But it scared me shitless. I'm really scared me. I mean, it scared me because of the creatures in it. It scared me because the docks were these no man's land where it were continually bringing the stuff from exotic places. But, you know, there was all these stories of the bananas containing poisonous spiders. Really? Um, <laughs> yeah, you know, probably from Argentina or wherever. I don't know. Probably, probably from Argentina. <laughs> yeah, they were full of poisonous spiders, guys. Yeah. yeah. But that sense of the sense, the sea was represented. And also the thing about living in a port is you never, you never really feel at home because people are always leaving it. Anyone who comes here, we we're just saying to Rachel, our technician the other day, just now about how you, people go to Cheltenham where she's living, where she is now, and it's a great place to go to other places on the same with Southampton. And a port is also, it's an extreme place because it's where, because it's where the land runs out. It's where, laws become the most extreme mm. so the kind of the, the the leaving of the land is problematic in a port much more than where there's a beach like a resort which is you go to Torquay or or you know any but Brighton where they're, they're places which are built to, to access the water here there's a sense of being withheld from it um, and so for me or there was all these reasons why I felt the sea was really scary place and so fast forward to the late 19, mid 1980s, a little bit later, late 1980s. So I started going to Haggerston Baths in, in Hackney, which were wonderful Edwardian bars. There were still different entrances for men and women. You could go in, you know, big terracotta, Art Nouveau terracotta signs, nice. men and women. So you had to make this gender decision before you went in. It's quite yeah. interesting. And the, and the pool, I went back there recently, it's, it's now sort of derelict, but... I realized it had this great arched tiled uh, roof, which was like the belly of a whale. I realized now it was like Jonah and the whale. And I, I just go there and I just like splash about trying to work out how to do this thing. And um, this elderly lady, she was certainly in her eighties. She might've even been older in a boned swimsuit, you know, with like corseted swimsuit with a rubber cap with Daisy on it. She, she saw what I was trying to do and she did all the, my PE master at school, I, was, I, was, I went to a monastery school, I was taught by monks and my PE master was a former army sergeant major. And, you know, there was no empathy there for a wussy kid like me who didn't like games. And, you know, the idea of going into the swimming pool with all those hairy, smelly boys was really <laughs> off-putting. 
um, she, 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 she made me, we were talking a little bit before we spoke about, got up, gone online uh, about liminality. She told me to break that membrane, the skin of the water and put my face in it. And that, that's what changed me entirely. And I realized that I wasn't going to die. And there was something sensual about it. It didn't have to be sporty or, or proactive or, you know, that demonstrate your masculinity. Yeah. It could be sensual. Uh, yeah. Baudelaire spoke about swimming as being being kissed a thousand times a minute. Oh wow! Um, I'm going to say that. Of, know, that forever now. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, so that's what changed me. And ever since then, I, I I'll swim in a puddle. Um, I'll swim anywhere, and and, and I do. Oh, great. Dan, you also had like an older lady in your life that is the your inspiration for climbing. Yes. Well, I suppose. Yeah, in terms of that, so the climbing book, the inspiration for that was my great, great aunt, um, Dorothy, Dorothy Pilly. She was Dorothea in the family. Um, and I think the th she, well, she was the amazing, she had an amazing life generally, but um, she was a pioneering mountaineer together with my great, great uncle, I.A. Richards, who's known as a sort of English critic and poet to a lesser degree and friend of um, Eliot and not a friend of Levis, et cetera. <laughs> um, and uh, it's interesting because I think the thing that Dorothea taught me was about comfort or the lack thereof and how, and it's really what Philip is talking about, I think, it's to find your own comfort in a situation or an element that perhaps will seem both intimidating and slightly sort of chaotic and deadly um, if you don't know what you're doing or you don't have the confidence or, you know, you feel you feel that sense of dread um, because it seems scary because you haven't actually explored it. Mm -hmm. um, and I think my experience of climbing and certainly my experience really of going to places that are apparently impossible to get to or hard, difficult places is that I'm not going expecting any level of comfort, really. I just know that I will probably have enough experience from other similar or different places. I'll have enough in my locker, to quote one of the, a guy called um, Sam, Sammy Samuels, who sounds like he should be sort of on a boat or a lighthouse or something. When I was doing a winter um, survival course in the Cairngorms, um, he said, you know, it's not the mountain that kills people, it's getting to the mountain that kills people when they're, you know, thinking only of the mountain and they haven't bothered to check the weather or what yeah. the snow is doing that day or, you know, and it's coming back from the mountain when everyone's cock a hoop and then they fall off because they think the danger's over. It's about being present in the moment. Mm -hmm. It's about doing your preparation. And part of that preparation is knowing that you have enough in your locker, in your head, yeah. to get you out of any situation that you get yourself into. So there will be people in these mountains today, he said, gesturing, you know, very sort of, you know, in these mountains today who don't know how to do an axe arrest. So if they start sliding, they'll have an axe, but they won't know how to use it to stop themselves. They won't yeah. take hold of the ads and put it in and sort of slow themselves. They won't know how to dig a snow hole. If they fall off the, a mountain and break their leg, they won't be able to survive long enough for, uh, for people to find them. You know, so in um sorry, but in a way, because I was reading your um like Dorothea is um your inspiration for a previous book, but she's also in Outpost. Yeah, you mentioned her there, and I wonder whether you have this. I, it just made me think when I when I found her in that book. I'm like, this is it's like she's there with you anyway in the rest of your journeys. Like she's this presence that, yeah. you know. She's, she's, she's in the book twice. The first time is really the genus of the book, which was the fact that when I was climbing for the last book, I was staying in these high altitude hostels, which are above the snow line. So they're, you know, high up on mountains. You get them mainly in, in Europe. Um, but, you know, if you imagine that it, most people won't climb a whole mountain in a day. They'll go up and some of them will go through the line of altitude sickness where your body has to yeah. sort of take time to yeah. adjust. Yeah. And then they will get to a kind of cabin. And if they're lucky, there is somebody there to look after them and there'll be nice beds and it'll be relatively warm and somebody to cook for them and give them a beer. And if you're in Switzerland, they'll do all that for let's say 500 pounds. And, um, 
then you they wake you up with a torch in your face the following morning at stupid o'clock when it's still very blue outside and then you carry on climbing. Um, so you can start your day when it's deeply dark and deeply cold and then you can do your do your thing, get to the top if that's what you want to do and then get back. And when I was climbing that book and experiencing that book, I began to think about these huts that were in, you know, terra incognita for, for most people you know you never consider what's up that big high mountain these huts are so small you know you struggle to see them with the naked eye but you're arrowing towards them and then I began thinking about what other kind of outposts are there that we or I or you or whoever has never thought of yeah. but they were once very important you know when Shackleton had his amazing rearguard action from Elephant Island and he gets to South Georgia it's a Norwegian whaling station that he gets to yeah you know, and he is the, possibly the first person to make this crossing of the interior of South Georgia over these uh, glaciers, these deadly sort of, you know, forms. And, you know, he's gone there and he's, he's been in this open boat and then he gets there and it's Norwegian whalers who he gets to. And suddenly this place, you know, it, he's, he's not seen anybody other than his crew for years. And suddenly there's, a, there's this buzzing sort of like almost metropolis mm -hmm. of, of whalers and there's a couple of hundred Norwegians there. And so you, you can just imagine that, but now that outpost is completely abandoned. You know, there are, it's been taken over by these feral reindeer who are the kind of, the, the, the Norwegians took down there with them for food. The reindeer have got it all back, that sort of thing. So it was once really, really important. The whaling was so important and, you know, not just there, but all around the world. And now it's a ghost place. So I began thinking about ghosts as well. And the other time that Dorothea crops up is when I'm in, Seattle, above Seattle, a place called Bellingham, and she's in the window of a shop. Uh, she's on the front of a book about American mountaineering, and I double take to look in this secondhand bookshop, and there's a book with my great great aunt on the cover. And if you imagine like a rock face going up at sort of you know 30 degrees, 60 degrees like that, she's in the middle of these of these climbers, and you just double take and go, that's Dorothea, and she was just there. And of all the books in all the windows of all the right. towns, that aren't, you know. Thank you, because you had a tricky yeah. them. So she was there to sort of go, it's all right, Dan. It's fine. She, yeah. you know, that's when I thought it's very unlikely that I'm going to get eaten by any bears. And I was half right. I'm not going to die this time. <laughs> what about ghosts uh, with you, Philip? What do you think? Because I know you're also um, interested in them. Yeah, I mean, I, I yeah, I where I swim is in the uh, shadow of a medieval abbey, a ruined medieval abbey. And um, there's lots of reports of ghosts from there. Um, and uh, I definitely believe in ghosts. Mm -hmm. uh, I've lived in haunted houses. Um, uh, there was a house in, in Hackney actually where I lived and um, we were, my friends and I were doing the Ouija board but this is when I was working at Rough Trade, and um, and um, this this voice came out and said it was uh, a soldier who'd been killed in the First World War, and um, he didn't get the year he died, and it, I, I I was doing it with people I really trusted, and uh, we were drunk and stoned basically. Uh, and we got sort of freaked out because we were looking, I was looking at my friends, thought, you know, these are people whose eyes I could look into and say, you know, stop pissing about. And they weren't, they were, it was whatever. Anyway, so we all got a bit freaked out and stopped doing it. And I went to bed uh, and uh, actually it was the next night, it was the next night and uh, I was in bed and it wasn't late in the evening actually, I was reading or something and I heard a woman sobbing in the house. It's an old Victorian terraced house. And um, it's really definite. And I thought maybe it was coming from next door. No, I, I knew the people either side, they were sort of students, young people. It wasn't, it was, in fact, they weren't even there. And I went downstairs, my, my housemate was there. He was, he was the designer who was working for our record label at the time. And I said, Dave, you all right? I said, he said, yeah, he was just, he was, he was reading the Daily Mirror and smoking a fag. I said, you didn't hear anything? I said, no, no, I didn't hear anything. I thought nothing more about this until last year, when for the 1914-18 project, they had um, uh, commemorations. They set up a website where you could put a, uh, a postcode into, into this site and find out where 
um, people had died during the First World War, the casualties where they'd lived. And I put in the postcode of where I live here, and there's only a few people in this street. It wasn't there, and other people's postcodes I put in. And I, for some reason, I, I had forgotten entirely about the story from Beck Road where I lived. Um, but, and I didn't, that wasn't in, in my mind at all, but I put postcode in and and it died there in 1917. And um, that was really strange because I'd even forgotten about it, you know. Uh, so I don't know. I mean, that's that's one thing. I've had various other experiences and things, but I, I, it's, it's the ghosts of the living as much that I think are really interesting or, or, or you know, the ghosts that kind of steer your life. Uh, was the ghosts of spirits, you know, so sort of people like, Dan and Dorothea. I mean, by myself, there was a woman in, I lived with in Provincetown in Cape Cod. She was my landlady. And she was in her 80s um, when I really got to know her. And she was ferocious. She used to go out kayaking into the bay. You know, she's 88 when she died a couple of years ago. And she'd go out and she'd feed flounder to orca. So she was an artist, amazing artist, Pat de Groot. So they would hang around so she could draw them. And then she'd draw um, cormorants on the breakwater with a waterproof pen but she was she had a really she she adopted me and she saw I was getting interested in the sea she realized I wasn't what I seemed to be which some Nancy English person uh, 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 and um, she she was she who made me go and see the whales and see them in a very different way in a way which was it's not scientific, it's not literary. It's yeah. a great essay, there's a great essay by John Fowles called The Tree about how we can't experience, or we can't write about our experience of the natural world because there are no words to bridge that distance yeah. and that connection. Mm. Um, and she, she, she changed me, she changed me. She's, she's a really extraordinary character and she had she believed herself. She, she. I think she felt she was more animal than human. Um, she was. She lived in quite a feral sort of way. Um, so yeah, I think spirits. You know, like I, the house. This house has spirits. You know, uh, uh, I, I feel them here. Um, they're not well, unhappy. But I was um, watching at home in Bath and um, in the family home in Bath, and we have two ghosts there which my mum is really nice. Recently, I was, well, before the lockdown, I was back in Bath and I was talking to my mum in the kitchen and she went out into the hall and um, she said, oh, and then she came back in and she said, oh, the lady just went past. Um, and she's seen her a couple of times. And I said, oh, what's she like? And she said, oh, I don't really know. We don't, we don't talk or anything, as if I'd asked a silly wow. question. She went, <laughs> just going out to make sure she's okay. Because every time she goes past, I just, you know, want to just check that everything's all right. So she's one, the lady who just walks past and my mum will just sort of check on. And Did your mum describe her at all, Dan? She's got a kind of long, long dress. It's a Georgian, sort of pre-Georgian Queen Anne house. So it's had a lot of, it's had quite a strange and troubled sort of history as a house. When my parents got it, it had been squatted in for a long time. Um, and some of it had been set on fire. And the last people to properly live there had taken, like literally ripped out, not just the fireplaces, but all of the copper, all of the electrics. Wow. So it was really quite a shell. It had a good roof, so it survived so long. But, um, you know, there were lots of needles under the floorboards and things like that from when it had been squatted in. Um, and it was, you know, we've put it back and my parents have put it back um, really beautifully. And that in a way is why they're concerned about the ghost because both my mum and my dad say, well, we want the, them, them to be happy with the work we're doing in that way, in that sense of connection. Yeah. The other ghost is a very small dog, uh, which is kind of like a sort of like runty little dog, uh, no. which is quite sort of like runny aroundy. No. And they see that in one corner. No, that's fantastic. That's amazing. Yeah. I'm gonna ask you both because um, I'm just conscious of time. And I think there's like a lot of things um, that I, it makes me feel when I read what you write, that you talk how you write. And when I read, Yourself. I feel like I'm talking to you anyway. So um, I'm going to ask you both to read a little bit if you okay. want. It would be really okay. nice. Um, you can choose whichever part you want, but I would love to hear you read it. Okay. Um, Shall I read something about 
about ghosts. Yeah. So that would seem to work. I'm gonna read uh, the, I the Iceland bit. Oh uh, yeah, I'll read a bit of Iceland. Yeah. Okay. Um, so this is, this is about to contextualize it. When I was in Iceland for the Outpost book, I went to a place that is called a Silahus. Um, and the name translates as a uh, house of joy. So they were originally bought, built by the Norse to make crossing the Icelandic interior possible, like a series of outposts to be joined, like a series of dots. And the, the Sila house I went to shore up and kind of renovate, because all of these buildings have been renovated multiple times, um, is run by an organization called Ferda Fjellag Islands. Um, and it's called Kvitarnas, and it was built in 1930 on the site of many other buildings. And I will try not to do a terrible Icelandic accent. <laughs> you know, this place that we are going is a very haunted house, Stefan had announced on the drive out. Oh, yes, I'd asked. Oh, yes, he'd repeated, whilst Atli, our carpenter, nodded. But that was about as far as we got in the four by four. At dinner, the first night, he told me the story. This is a very Icelandic story. It's the most Icelandic story you'll ever hear. <laughs> you notice that this house is built near some old, old farm ruins, he began, pointing to a series of hummocks outside. Well, there lived a farmer and his wife, and they had a girl working too. The farmer tried to sleep with the girl, but she said no. And so, in revenge, he locked her outside during a snowstorm. So she died. And the farmer was killed by his wife to avenge the, po the poor girl. Stefan ended this story with a meaningful look. <laughs> I see, I said. Then we walked round to the room next door where there was a bunk built at 90 degrees to all the other bunks. That's the bad bed, he told me. That's built across a doorway. Sleep there and the girl runs through you. Atlee nodded and so did I. But strange as it might seem, none of this seemed abnormal. Kvitanas existed in a land apart, completely other, with its own unique light and gravity. And then, a few days later, I descended the stair ladder from the loft where I slept to find Atli cooking breakfast and Stefan sitting red-eyed on his bunk. He looked a washed out wreck. The ghost, he said flatly, massaging his nose. I had a long night with the ghost. He described his haunting as a series of dreams, dreams within a dream, none of them good. He'd been woken by a weight on his chest, something pinning him, pressing so that he could not breathe. He tried not to panic. He asked it to please get off him. He was polite, unnatural silence, not quiet, a total lack of sound, apart from his breathing, shallow, and creaking. He was not sleeping in the bad bunk, but a lower bunk in the front room where we all ate. Still held fast, the slats of the bed above a few inches from his nose, he began to talk as best he could about the work we were doing on the cabin, the fact we were repairing the building, respecting the fabric of the place and landscape, explaining that we meant no harm. And then it was gone, the ghost, the present, the weight, and he closed his wet eyes and filled his pained lungs and turned to sit sideways out of the bunk, head in hands, aware the oily twilight was pooling in the room. And then after an indeterminate time, minutes or hours, he climbed the stair ladder to Atlee's room and got into bed with him. And Atlee woke up and turned wide-eyed and Stefan opened his mouth to explain and woke downstairs with an apparition pressing on his chest. And he could not breathe. This happened a number of times. I'm part troll, so I can deal with it, he told me with a wry smile, but he looked utterly knackered, like a man who'd fought his way out of a supernatural tumble dryer. Wow. I love that. I love what happens after that as well, Dan. Uh, I don't want to get into that, but it's, <laughs> that is a really, truly freaky bit when, what happens to you and stuff. Oh, well, yeah, I mean, it's, I, th I have a certain theory about, you know, that everyone's experiencing weird dreams at the moment. So many people are having these sort of like crazy yeah. psychedelic or just really, you know, 
just vivid dreams. And I think there's something about earthing oneself by traveling and walking. And that's probably what you do, Philip, with your swim in a way, this kind of the bioluminescence. I can imagine coming out of you as electricity as much as being in the water anyway. Where swimming is a very like sort of zen, I I find it, we talked about this the other day, because of the breathing and everything, it's almost like you're meditating. So you you cannot not be present when you're swimming. Exactly. And you're so in it that you're so vulnerable, like you're almost naked. You're in this massive thing that contains us all. Mm. Um, You're connected to everything. I think certain landscapes are like that as well. I mean, I felt that in Iceland. I felt like anything man-made in certain Icelandic, certain landscapes in the world are like lightning rods for all of the sort of like strangeness in that place. Because the landscape is fine, you know? The landscape is itself. And then you've got this thing, this person or this house, and you can just see it's the start of a horror film. You just think, well, it's all gonna there. That's where it's that's ba- that's a bad idea. Yeah. Don't do that. Yeah. Um, sorry, Philip, you were going to read. Yeah, yeah, no, no. I guess it's kind of sort of fits the uh, fits the mood, maybe. An hour before dawn, before the light starts to stain their winter sky violet, I ride back to the beach. Foxes sidle out of the woods and rabbits flush their white scuts at the approach of my bike light. High in the trees over the shore, a pair of tawny owls converse in screeches. Crows hang in the branches, all angular beaks and tails as if they'd been born out of the bowls. All these creatures own this place in the interregnum of the dark. They should not be anywhere else. No one could have told you when you were young what would happen. They didn't dare. It's enough to realize that what we have lost is still ahead of us. I see things that are not there. One magical moment, I feel like a penitent. The sea is so still, it seems like a sin to break its surface, but I do. Swimming at night with diminished sense of sight only makes the act all the more sensual You feel the water around you. You lose yourself in its sway. Fish bite me, leaving loving grazes. I turn on my back, watching the stars fall. I first saw it slumped on the weedy slipway one afternoon. A deer sprawled at the high water mark. It looked perfect lying there, thrown up by the tide, staring glassy eyed to the sky. Had it died trying to swim across from the forest? Or had it slipped and fallen, cloven hooves, clattering on the concrete with panic in its eyes? Perhaps it had been shot, although there was no wound in its russet pelt. The next day, someone had hauled out this sea deer, this antlered seal, and impaled it on the spikes of the metal railings. It hung there by its neck, dangling as a warning the way farmers nail dead owls, wings outstretched to barn doors. I wanted to relieve it of this indignity, to take it down from its cross, but I hadn't the strength. So I waited to see what would happen next. The following day, it reappeared on the shore as if it had climbed down overnight. It was accompanied by a carrion crow tentatively but intimately pecking away at the flesh, performing the last rites. I wished the bird well and a good breakfast. I'd forgotten about the carcass until a week later I came across its remains in the surf. By now the body had been reduced to a single strand of vertebrae, picked clean by crabs and gulls. It was down to its essential scaffolding, its skeletal beauty twisted like the ghost of a horned sea serpent lolling in the water. The stubby stubby antlers sprouted from the bulbous, rough-edged rings on the forehead. Caught between them was a scrappy fetlock of fur. Skeins of gray flesh still hung about the skull, scrappily attached to the thin white bone. I had to have it, this grotesque piece of flotsam something to add to the pile back home, to the fragments of blue and white china, the clay pipes with the bloom still on them, the shards of misty sea glass, 
the chunks of green glazed medieval pots, the stones pierced with holes. Using a piece of driftwood to hold down the spine, I pulled at the antlers, twisting and wrestling with them as with a bull. It occurred to me as I did so, how easy it would be to detach a human head. With a stagger, I succeeded in wrenching off my trophy, my prize for having waited so patiently. I had to gouge out a gelatinous eye before stuffing the skull into a plastic bag and tying it to the back of my bike. I rode away from the beach, passing walkers who wouldn't guess at my cargo. Back home, I opened a hole in the warm brown earth and buried the head up to its antlers. They stood proud of the soil like a pruned rose bush. I piled rocks on top to guard against predators and went back indoors to wait till the antlers sprouted and grew like branches. And as below the surface, the skull grew roots which became bones, its lost vertebrae, femurs and ribs all restored, ready to rear up out of the earth a resurrected, newly grown deer of my own. Wow. <laughs> I was such a timid great. kid. How I ever got to do that? I would, I would never, I didn't go near a slug when I was a boy, you know. This and, um, is amazing. I love, I mean, <laughs> I, I love that bit in the book as well, because it's the bit at the end where you take it back and people are like, well, okay, okay, mm. we've got to the point, you know, he's taken them back, you know, yeah. he, He's revealed himself as this, as the kind of like, you know, the, the ultimate flotsam kind of, yeah. sort of, and you know, that's, that's quite macabre. I wonder what he's going to do next. Like, well, I'm going to grow my own army. Of <laughs> deer. Well, yeah. Oh, right. Okay. Well, I, I, I did not see that coming. How bold. Um, and that's lovely in a way, because, you know, the, my outpost begins with this idea of the, the polar bear pelvis that my yes. dad. Yeah, exactly. Um, and so that really reminds me of that. Yeah, we have we both have these kind of and I see that pelvis at the start of the book. So my dad was exploring uh, Svalbard, a Norwegian archipelago towards the North Pole just before I was born. He brings back this pelvis and the pelvis becomes for me a type of prism through which to see both <laughs> my dad's explorations before my birth and also kind of the idea of adventure is all locked in there. And it's in I think you have a similar idea with the, with that that deer in a way it's kind of talking of lightning kind of lightning bolts and and also you know uh the things they put on churches i've forgotten what lightning rods mm. that was a lightning rod for you mm. i sense mm. it kind of like had this great feral mm. animating energy about it mm. object i mean objects natural objects because we invest them with a the kind of charm like quality and talismanic power you know like yeah. the holy stone you know rob mcfarlane wrote this book recently with stanley illustrated didn't he about the um about um the nest uh, box, about hagstones hagstones yes which are, and, and are they my I, I remember hagstones because my mother whose cabinet is a cabinet in the corner <laughs> that came from her house she lived in a bungalow in the new forest and in that cabinet was a holy stone and that's the first holy stone I ever remember because I wasn't that afraid, I wasn't that familiar with beaches when I was a little boy, but I was fascinated by the stone. And she said it was it was for good luck. And I never really realized what that meant until I went to the Pitt Rivers Museum in Cambridge. Mm -hmm. And he had a whole tray of these stones, which he collected from various places, and um, with little labels describing that these ones were used to hang around the necks of cows to stop them being milked at night by witches. Some were hung around the prows of fishing boats to protect them from drowning. So, yeah. you know, there's a, because it's like you say, it's the prism, it's the, even now I, I pick up a stone, I have to pick up a stone with a hole in it every day from the beach. And I always richly look up through it mm. and in a sort of M.R. James way, imagine I'm gonna see Shelley yeah. being drowned out there or the Black, yeah. Death, because the Black Death is said to have entered Britain through Southampton water and this, wow. so, you know, that sense of, they do, they do take you back to the past. I mean, they physically yeah. are connections and those yeah. stones are millions of years old and they've witnessed those things. They, you know, Wilfred Owen trod, the beach where I swim, Wilfred Owen was there um, when he was recuperating from shell shock. I mean, he walked over those stones. Yeah. Left yeah. a little bit of Wilfred Owen there. 
But those okay. things are very magical. I have this thing of, um, I grew up in Argentina, but my dad's family is from Italy, from a fishing village called mm -hmm. Camogli, close to Genoa. And on the first time I came to Europe, I went to that same village and I swam in that bay. And the whole time what I was thinking was that thing of like, almost like the archeology span of my own, like I am swimming in the same water, even though it's not the same water, but I'm swimming, I'm coming down the beach on the same pebbles, on the same water that maybe someone five generations ago swam here for the last time, mm. felt whatever it was that they felt and then left for the new world and never came back. Mm. Really interesting. Yeah. And, you know, and there was something about being in that water at that moment that I, it, you know, it's a bit religious. It felt like a baptism of like, yeah, yeah. But it just felt home. Yeah. You but know? Also this idea of 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 the stones, as you say, they are witness. They are bearing witness. But also, yeah. they're quite. Um, there's also a sense which I find quite comforting about the idea of kind of like this unmoved mover. You know, they're not terribly interested in that. They're kind of you know perhaps quietly amused, but um, they don't really feel anything so the fact that we are passing through yeah. you know that at the start of the thing i was really interested in pelvises and about this idea of prism the idea of aperture mm. um you know and it's quite interesting with the with the deer you know the eye the eye at first it looks quite it looks at the heavens and then it becomes other than an eye you know it becomes changed um there's a quote from georgia o'keefe who um you know was was interested also in 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 Sort of the prismatic possibility of looking through things and looking into things. Yeah. And she, she wrote in one of her catalogues, when I started painting the pelvis bones, I was most interested in the holes in the bones and what I saw through them, particularly the blue from holding them up in the sun against the sky, as one is apt to do when one seems to have more sky than earth in one's world. Wow. They were most beautiful against the blue, that blue that will always be there as it is now after all man's destruction is finished. And that's I think the other, that's really Dan, that's the other thing about what we're talking about. The, the thing about the sea specifically, because that's it has this evolutionary uh, prelapsarian uh, power for us because it's where we came from. But it's also the place where we're going as well. And it's yeah. it's changing our that's the future is the sea. Mm. And that's what's going to it, it change our future in many ways, as well as viruses and whatever else. But, um, and for me, that's why it's really interesting because it, it's a kind of transgressive place for that reason. And it's a place where you start to change yourself. You know, when you, you know, when you're walking up a mountain, you start to walk more like an animal. When you swim, you more, move more like an animal. Um, and I think that's a lot to do with, you know, for me, especially, it's, it's the sense of like when you're growing up, trying to establish what your identity is, you know, this, what, what do you mean? What is your, what's your physical relationship to the world? And I think mm. I read in what you do, that's what you're trying to sort out. Certainly what I do in the sea, I mean, it's, it's, it's not a displacement theory um, uh, uh, activity. It's something which is- The opposite. Mm. Opposite, exactly, exactly yeah, yeah. opposite. Exactly the opposite. Well, it's it's that question of, you know, where do you stand on this? Our language is so full of you have to have a position and uh, so much language suggests that you have to be one thing. Whereas yeah. I think actually what all of us do and actually Malu and your work in theater and everything like that, we're exploring the spaces in between things and we're seeing what we can be in this situation as opposed to what we are. So we're embracing the change, but we're also embracing the possibility of, I suppose, of error, you know, exciting accidents, yeah, yeah, yeah. kind of the performativity of stress to yeah, some yeah. degree, where you're outside your comfort zone. And that's where the interesting things happen. So often in my books, I am in situations, I mean, Malu, you always say, you know, I'm always trying to kill myself, or I always yeah, see- I'd say, you're not trying to kill yourself. You're almost always about to die. <laughs> yes, <laughs> that's, that's a crucial <laughs> difference. But, you know, I'm I'm interested in that thing. And, you know, with the mountaineering book, people said to me, oh, it seemed that you weren't very well prepared. And I was like, no, I was, but I still did it. Yeah. <laughs> because that is the point at which I'm interested. I don't want to write. I can't, physically can't. 
it would be untrue. Write a book from the perspective of a scientific expert about something. Mm. I am from this great history and great lineage of enthusiastic amateurs. Mm. And perhaps the spectator sees more of the game in that way because the enthusiasm means I get into, I get in above my head, but then I get in above my head all the time. Like walking to the, walking to Tesco, I get in above my head. I think it's that discomfort that's so interesting. Okay, so I've got a question for you because you've mm. both mentioned it and I actually was thinking about it. Like I said, you know, reading your books and talking to you is kind of similar, but like on a page or in real life. And so are you thinking about an audience when you're writing? Because I work in theater, so I always think about an audience, you know, and there is something that is the thing that we find in nature that makes us feel like, you know, and people say the theater of nature, the thing that makes take your breath away. And that's the magic that when you're doing a show, you wanna get people to feel that. And you feel those things in nature. You have those magic moments of mystical connection where it doesn't matter your stress and that you don't know what to do with yourself or whatever, because you're just in that moment feeling that. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so, you know, in your book, you both, in the, the things that you talk about, you both do that and are you, do, are you thinking about an audience, not when you're going on the exploration or the experience to then write about it, but when you're writing about it? I, I think Dan put his finger on it just a minute. It's, it's performance. It's all about performance. It's performative. You know, so you might even you might be performing to your, uh, yourself as an audience mm. or to one other person or to the people who are reading your book. And for me, it's, there's, there's a, there's a direct, I mean, for me, well, it's this person. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I don't very know. Very nicely over your head, Philip. That and was you got it in Spanish yeah. also. Well done. Oh, no. Yeah. Um, I think to... What, what to he did. Me, sorry. I think it's, it's, it's exactly that. I mean, it's the canon. You're, you're thinking about where you fit, perhaps, but also... Every time I write anything, I think it's an opportunity to kind of like almost have a conversation with everything that I love in art and literature and all of that stuff and create something. And isn't that a wonderful opportunity to do something and and perf that performative thing? And I always think about, you know, I think Johnny Marr says before he goes on stage to play, he thinks about all the music that he loves yeah. and he thinks about his favorite guitar players and he thinks about how tonight he is going to be like a, like a lightning rod and embody all the best bits of all the music that's moved him. And yeah. I think about a similar thing. And I know Philip, you know, we all, all three of us have a shared love of Bowie because he was really the ultimate artist in yeah. so many ways. Yeah, because, because, well, I mean, he educated me. I mean, in this house where I live in the suburbia, I would never have arrived at Jean Genet or, or the Expressionist painting or William Burroughs. It just mm. wouldn't have happened without him. Um, I, I, he is responsible for me because he's responsible for that opening up of my mind and, and, and possibilities. The sense of that you could have the outrageous idea of publishing a book at all and yeah. thinking that it's, it might be interesting to anyone. It, it's actually, I think the whole thing about that is, is that actually it doesn't, it's, it doesn't have to have an, it doesn't have to have this huge audience. There's this sense of, you know, you're writing for someone. It, I often find myself writing for one person. When I'm writing a passage, I'll be writing for one person will be in my mind at that point. And I think, yeah, they're gonna like that, you know, and they'll go with it. A different person you, or the same person? No, it's different people, different people. The actual people that exist, it's not like, okay, uh, uh, no. no, but I wrote my last book for him. Yeah. I had his address. I was about to send it to him. I would finished the book when he left us. Mm. I was writing the book in Cape Cod when oh, the, I'd finished writing it and it was written as a love letter to him. Um, I mean, anyone who knows anything about him will know that why the cover is that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I got in contact with you, didn't I? Because I was in did. Paris and I went to see the Picasso exhibition. Yeah. And that's where, I mean, I don't know if that's exactly where he got it, but that yeah. was the font and it was all really together. Yeah. And um, I think, I think absolutely this idea of permission, but also this idea of, as we were saying, to sort of wrap it nicely together in a way, it's that idea of sort of, guiding lights in a way 
this mm. idea of this idea of muse and guiding yeah. and that can be landscape that can be person yeah. that can be a sense of place that can just be the electricity of the act itself mm. maybe yeah. yeah well guys this has been an amazing incredible conversation i'm gonna have to wrap up now because i think we're coming to the end of our time but uh thank you so much both of you philip and dan and to everyone who's been watching i'm gonna say a hello to my family watching in argentina and the states yes Hola. yes <laughs> and um there's lots of more uh, more incredible events online for the rest of the week so just go on the website bookbound 2020 or follow them on Twitter or on Instagram, and then you can find out more about the rest of the conversations. Um, and if you'd like to buy the books, um, where where can they go? They can go on Hive. That's where where we're sending yeah. people to buy the books. Yes, it's really um, good because there it's a local. It supports independent bookshops, and they say and they pay their taxes. And you can buy Bowie vinyl on there as well, which I advise people to do. Amazing. Um, yeah. So we're sending everyone to Hive to buy the books there. And please remember to look into the Just Giving page for Mind um, and donate because it's uh, extraordinary times and everyone yeah. need a bit of love uh, and some books. So you can also send books to people. Uh, thank you so much. It's been amazing to talk to you both. And yeah, thanks thank you. for having us. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much. Bye. 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 Just keep waving. We keep Just waving. Keep waving. <laughs>